Good evening, I'm David Nicholas. Next on CMU Public Television, Senator John Mullinar, right here on Capitol Report. Welcome to Capitol Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. Welcoming you to uh, joining us here tonight. Thanks very much for your time and attention. We're welcoming uh, State Senator John Mullinar, Republican from Midland, uh, currently serving in his first term as a senator from the Michigan's uh, 36th District. Happy New Year, Senator. Good to have you back. Thank you, David. Nice to be with you. First, your reaction to Governor uh, Rick Snyder's State of the State address. Um, did it point to you uh, enough of a direction of what you think are the priorities for uh, the upcoming year? Are you looking for some more specifics coming from the budget proposal? What was your takeaway from sure. the speech? Well, I think the state of the state is a broad overview. And as you mentioned, in three weeks, we'll have the governor's budget presentation. I thought it was a very upbeat speech that focused on you know, where we've been over the last few years and where we're headed. Uh, I thought there were some encouraging news about uh, home values increasing, personal growth increasing, population uh, increasing in Michigan, and, and jobs increasing. And so all good trends for our state, and uh, look forward to working with the governor in this next uh, legislative year. One of those specifics for those that sometimes sit there with the adding machines and, and uh, look at where some of the spending priorities might be, the additional $65 million for early childhood programs that the governor would like to see. Um, again, sort of the same question, did you see enough when it comes to K-12 funding or higher ed funding in terms of whether or not you think that those funding uh, streams will be increased or are we looking again for more of the specifics when the proposal comes? I think we'll have a lot more specifics when the, the budget comes out and the proposal on February 5th, but he did highlight that he wants to add an additional 65 million for early childhood. This past year we put in 65 million, which was the largest increase and also the largest amount of any state in the country. Uh, he would like to continue that uh, in this next budget and have uh, no wait uh, early childhood program so that any child who uh, qualified and, and was families that were interested but maybe couldn't afford uh, an early childhood program would have that opportunity in Michigan. So it's a significant investment. It's been a huge priority for the governor and for the legislature and, and uh, that's going to be one of the highlights of his budget. As you mentioned though, higher ed, K-12 uh, also need to be funded and, and I believe that will be part of the budget uh, when it comes out on February 5th. Going back to the 2000s, we've seen such a kind of roller coaster ride just because we've had such a troubled economy through that time. When we talk about that much more of an investment, although everyone thinks it's a good idea, is that or perhaps getting back some of the funding for K-12 or higher ed sustainable in your view? You know, I, I've had concerns at different times about the investments and that making sure that we can sustain those in the long term. Uh, right now we have a projected $970 million surplus. As you can imagine, people are already lining up waiting to spend that money. We don't know how much of that is one-time funding that is just because the economy is turning around uh, or that which can be sustained. So I think we need to be cautious in how we approach our budget and make sure we can continue to do the priorities in education as well as paying down long-term debt, uh, putting money in the rainy day fund, and uh, let's not forget our roads, which are underfunded at this time, too. Your district, the 36th, uh, includes your hometown of Midland, the part of the Great Lakes Bay, up the east uh, coast of the state. Uh, among those districts, what are some of, uh, or what do you see still as some that are struggling with uh, the inequity that we still see in the K-12 funding? Well, I think it, it's across the board, the challenge we've had in Michigan is that we've lost students, we've lost population. Uh, in the last decade, Michigan was the only state to lose population. Our, our funding structure for education is built on a per student amount. So any district that lost students, which most of them did in Michigan, uh, that creates a financial burden. So our school districts have tightened their belt. Uh, the governor was pointed out in the state of the state that actually over the last three years, we have added $600 per student additional uh, from the Michigan funding, from state funding. Now, at the same time, some of the federal dollars that were in the school budgets have declined, 
And of course, with declining enrollment because of the loss of population, that's affected school districts too. So we know we want to backfill for education. Uh, we want to keep investing. Um, but the challenge will be, you know, at what level compared to other priorities like roads and, and our infrastructure and, and other priorities. So uh, I'm, my two priorities right now are, are funding our infrastructure and funding education. I think those need to be the two areas where we invest uh, going forward. What about the call for the potential move to year-round schooling? Um, when I came through a school that, that I didn't even know that that was an option. I knew people in other states. I had a sister that had moved out of state years ago and knew that uh, their school system was doing that. But uh, it's not practiced widely here, but in some areas, how much of a um, potential could we see, and especially when we look at how we pay for that or, or running two systems within one district and, and so forth, how would we see the potential to move maybe to year-round school? Sure. Well, I, the governor proposed pilot projects and, and areas, you know, as, a, as a, an optional uh, kind of program. So it's not, not a mandate at this time. Um, and the concept is that, you know, if we went year round, there wouldn't be as loss in student knowledge and understanding, um, keep young people engaged in their learning throughout the year. You know, our, our model was built on an ag agrarian model in the early uh, years. Um, some have questioned how would that impact, you know, agriculture, how would it impact tourism and some of our northern Michigan. But I do think it, it merits uh, doing some pilot projects because we are in a global economy. We're competing with uh, countries around the world, some of who go year round. And there are also school districts even in the United States that are doing that year round. Uh, but I think we would need to see what kinds of positive results would come from those pilot projects and how would that translate into a broader uh, general public. I'm glad you brought up that point. It was actually next on my list too that the, knowing how much especially northern Michigan can rely on agriculture and tourism and thinking again about that map of your district sure. you would have both ends of the spectrum the schools in the cities where it might not be as much of a concern but young kids needed in some of the smaller communities to help run some of those small ag or, or tourism businesses based in the family how how could we potentially balance having and and is that viable to have is that fair in the end to the students if we have maybe a mixture of both if we can't put everybody under right. some same tent? Well, I think that's where we'd want to look and see what we can learn from different pilot projects because those, you know, I am concerned about the, the gap, the time gap that we do have students uh, out of school and there is a loss of learning that occurs. And, um, but as you mentioned, there are certain family businesses and, and different opportunities for young people, although I do think it's a bit different than it was maybe a generation ago where you had young people uh, working on the family farm all summer long, all the students, you know, having jobs uh, on the farm, and, and uh, there's been a lot of technological advances and other uh, kinds of advances that it, it's probably not the same picture, but it's something before we go into this full force, we would want to have answers to those questions. Three years ago, the big uh, push in the state of the state was for uh, the new Detroit-Windsor Bridge. Last year, there was the, the big initiative and, and real central focus on um, the, uh, the project for putting the money back into the infrastructure. You mentioned it's a priority of yours. That did not, anything on that level did not, perhaps because it's an election year, get as much of a, a focus this time. Where do we stand then, sure. potentially, um, with, with that extra money for the road? Well, one, one thing the governor did mention is we were, even though his original proposal was not advanced in the legislature, we were able to put a quarter of a billion dollars more into our roads and bridges than the previous budget. So we are making incremental improvements. Um, you know, there was a pretty high uh, standard that was set when he was talking about 1.2 billion uh, on an annual basis. And so you know, coming up with that kind of funding is quite a challenge, but we did make significant improvements in that regard, and I think we'll hopefully continue to make those improvements budgeting on a year-to-year -year basis, and of course he wants to look at it in a long-term uh, solution as well. Um, with respect to the new international bridge, of course, you know, the governor has proposed that. Uh, there's been a permit that's been authorized by the federal government. Um, it's also in the courts and would require 250 
million dollars uh, additional investment from the federal government, and my understanding is that's pretty much on hold. We still rank 47th in the nation uh, when it comes to unemployment. The governor pointed to uh, an increase um, or a stabilization when it came to the population. You noted that as well, um, and an increase in private sector jobs. Um, has anything um, in terms of reduction of state government or any of uh, the potential ripple effects that critics would point to from status of right to work, anything that is, is working against where we have seen the gains that after nearly a first term completed, we've gone not that many steps up the ladder when it comes to uh, the overall unemployment rate? Well, I think there have been improvements, and I think if you look at around the, the country in terms of our tax structure, our uh, credit rating, uh, Michigan is viewed much more favorably nationally and internationally than the past. Um, whether you read the Wall Street Journal or other business entities, our tax structure is much more competitive now. Uh, our regulatory structure, uh, you mentioned right to work. I think what that says is Michigan is open for business. Um, you know, one of the interesting statistics that has happened in Michigan, and I don't have the exact number, but there are more people now uh, seeking work. Um, sometimes these unemployment uh, numbers are skewed because people give up trying to find a job, and then they're actually not counted in the unemployment numbers. They're just kind of off the map. And where, other times where that number is included, and, and you have a rate that's, that's hovering around where the national average is, and then reports will say, but if you factor in those that are no longer working uh, or have given up and so forth, then the actual rate is this much higher. And this is where numbers get moved around, I guess, right. depending on, on what perspective somebody wants to have. And I think in the numbers the governor used in terms of our unemployment and, and opportunities in Michigan is more people are entering the workforce uh, than previous years. And so I think that's significant that maybe people who had given up trying to find a job are now working, and that is a positive thing. Long-term unemployed, um, do we see uh, any advantage uh, or, or any change really in, in that number when we look at where the possible impact of uh, the extension of the benefits to if there are jobs there, are these people taking the jobs? Does, does it get counteracted if we extend federal unemployment benefits and, and the human nature of some that, that don't go back to work because now technically some would not have to? Right. How, how do we see that push and pull play? Well, down? it is a concern. You want people to have the incentive to work. And one of the concerns I've had is as you extend benefits and give people incentives not to work, that really works against our citizens and it works against our job providers who are looking for people. Um, you always see the different statistics of you know, job openings and it's frustrating if in the incentives aren't there for people to in some way leave public assistance and move into those jobs. Um, I think you know, when you look at some of the encouraging signs of the automotive industry doing much better in Michigan, agriculture doing much better, in fact, increasing exports by 16 percent, um, I think our, our job providers are going to be looking for people and uh, we want to make sure those people have the right skills and also the right incentive to want those jobs because you don't want people just staying on government assistance because it's more attractive in the short run. In the long run, I think that's devastating. For those on both sides of the debate, what are the, the, the job providers in your district tell you as we look at the proposed uh, increase at all in the minimum wage, what impact that might have? Well, I have real concerns about that. I mean, we have increased our minimum wage over the last decade in Michigan significantly. Um, what you find is that for many job providers, that puts them in a position where they're laying people off, cutting back hours. You combine that with the Obamacare incentives where people are losing their jobs or getting their hours cut back and that would have a devastating effect on our state. So I'm very cautious. When I learned how this all worked was a time when there was a public library in my district that offered um, a coffee shop that was run, managed by people with disabilities. And what was, what was just horrible is when they went to the minimum wage increase just by a few dollars, uh, workers who had disabilities uh, were actually laid off or had their hours cut back because the coffee house couldn't make it at those additional wages. So you see that real life impact on people who may lose their jobs or have their 
hours uh, cut back because of it. Another portion of the workforce are our veterans. Last year, you sponsored uh, legislation that was uh, focused on uh, particularly that transition from military service back into uh, the workforce. How is that uh, progressing forward? What impact have we seen? Sure. Well, we've passed it through the Senate. It's awaiting action in the House. Um, the governor is very supportive. Uh, we're trying to make that transition so that the skills someone acquires in the military serving our country can be transferable into the private sector and the civilian life and want to give people credit for those skills that they've developed. Um, a few other areas that we've worked on for veterans, one is getting an accreditation with the federal government so our Veterans Administration and their Veterans Administration can communicate in a better way uh, to serve, whether it's job uh, you know, opportunities, uh, it can be healthcare related uh, or even education related. Sometimes the state and the federal units weren't communicating each other. So we've been working hard on that as well. You also uh, sponsored a measure last year that uh, uh, focused in on a, on a local business in your district that was providing uh, fertilizer products to uh, natural fertilizers out to the residential market. Um, the, the status then on, on that measure? That bill was signed into law and it, it's, it's one of those eliminating barriers to a business that's providing jobs and really has an opportunity to thrive in Michigan. Are they able now, have they seen any expansion to go beyond local area or are they still working to, to possibly go more regional or statewide yeah. than they already are? At this time they're doing a lot throughout the state and that just eliminates one of the barriers where they can uh, promote their product for different applications and very valid. A couple of springs ago when you joined us, we were talking then about a proposal that would uh, even out some of uh, the process uh, level of the playing field as you were describing it for construction permits and, and who was able to qualify for those works in the bidding process. Uh, that measure went through but then was challenged in the courts. Sixth Circuit upheld that measure, is that still where we stand and, and what has been, again, sort of that uh, the ripple effect and as we've looked back on it now as to what that's meant in uh, economic growth? Well, that is now the law of the land and Michigan is a model for that uh, type of legislation and what it did is eliminated um, unfair labor practices, uh, discriminatory practices that discriminated against a, a business that was either part of a union or not part of a union. And we said that that should not be the way we decide things in Michigan. It should be based on merit. It should be based on what the business brings to the table, regardless of whether they're part of a labor agreement or not. So by uh, putting this uh, provision into the law, uh, we believe there will be reduced costs of construction, whether it's a university campus building new buildings, whether it's uh, local municipality building something, anything with state dollars, uh, this law will save money for harder working taxpayers. So as we enter 2014, is there anything that, that you would put in that category of the, the unfinished business, things that you are still trying to see through from uh, fully from last year then, or pointing to perhaps the, the list of first priorities that you have coming up in the new year? Well, there's a number of priorities. and. You know, the budget's always an unfinished business because just when you get the one year done, you're pretty soon you're working on the next. And so that'll be one of my big priorities. Uh, we continue to work to expand uh, health care opportunities uh, with respect to OB doctors uh, in some of our rural areas of Michigan. In parts of my district, a woman has to go up to two hours to see an OB doctor. And that puts their health and lives at risk. That puts the child's uh, health and life at risk. And so. We're trying to incentivize through graduate medical education, through loan forgiveness, and uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates so that OB doctors want to practice uh, in Michigan. Another area that I'm working on in the healthcare area is uh, opening access for physical therapists so that if someone has a problem and they think a physical therapist may be able to help, they wouldn't have to get a doctor's prescription to do that. They could uh, go up to uh, 10 visits or up to 21 days for physical therapy without having to have a prescription. And when you have places like Central Michigan University with a uh, nationally renowned program, when these physical therapists are getting a tremendous uh, education, you want them to be on the front lines working with uh, people who need their help and, and not, again, not having a regulatory burden in the way. The target of, of Central Michigan's growing and now 
getting off the ground uh, school now with the second class getting lined up for uh, the fall of 2014. Uh, the focus a lot is on the family or, or general practice. You mentioned still uh, the lack of access to, to OBGYN care. Um, anything that bumps into that from, from provisions or regulations coming from the Federal Affordable Health Care Act that you see as, as impeding any of that goal of trying to expand care because the debate continues as to whether or not all aspects of that bill are, are going to be a plus or, or a detriment to overall health care. Well, I think clearly there will be a shortage, and I think CMU's medical school is right in that space where we're going to be graduating uh, medical students into the professions that are very much in, in need and demand. Um, one of the things I like about CMU's medical school is, as I've talked to some of the students, they are interested in practicing in Michigan. And to me, that's very encouraging because we want to develop talent in Michigan and keep it here in Michigan, uh, and that'll help our overall uh, structure. One of the concerns I have with the Affordable Care Act is I think there will be se severe shortages of primary care doctors who uh, are going to be able to see people. And so I think CMU is stepping right into a, a very important need and, and, and I'm confident uh, they'll do a great job as, as the program continues to proceed. From the federal or, or state level, and, and I'll admit that I'm, I'm not fully aware of how all of these are structured, but maybe you can help us here. There, there is sometimes uh, a need for, or at least a desire to have some incentives, whether it be the loan forgiveness that you mentioned earlier, or, or simply having some contracts set up to keep some of these students, or, or the goal to try to keep some of these students in central and northern Michigan. Is that funding, or are those funding sources stable moving forward so that these students that were graduating, if they're not going back to his or her hometown to practice, that we are going to be able to keep that talent pool here serving the needs, especially in the rural areas where we have the shortage. Sure. Well, we're doing it in a number of ways. And I mentioned the Medicaid reimbursement so that uh, physicians have an incentive to see uh, patients where they aren't losing quite so much money each time they see a patient. Um, and then the, the loan forgiveness is something where we can structure it so that it benefits uh, individuals who serve in underserved areas or uh, in specialties where there's not as many as are needed. Um, when it comes to graduate medical education, it gets a little bit more complicated because you have the federal component and the state component. We can't set parameters on the federal dollars just to incentivize people staying in Michigan, but we can do some things with our graduate medical education dollars uh, with our state dollars, and that's what we're looking at uh, in this next year. Uh, you serve on the Appropriations Subcommittee for the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, agriculture continues to be a growing and very strong, vital uh, aspect of what we do here in Michigan. Anything that, that we should be uh, watching for on the horizon coming in 2014? Well, I think, you know, the governor highlighted the increase in exports. And uh, so that's a very exciting thing. And, uh, you know, we continue to work at trying to find ways to add, have added value edu uh, agriculture so that it, whether it's food processing or other parts of the chain where you know food is developed you know we have great growers here in Michigan uh, sometimes uh, you know things have to leave our state in order to be processed and we'd like to do more of that here in Michigan that has been a goal and, and I want do we have any more specifics on proposed area I know that there have been certain sectors of the state where they say we we've got we've got space maybe we've got a former manufacturing mm -hmm. facility that we could convert what do we know about uh, certain areas or, or targeted communities trying to lure some of that processing so that we can keep it all here, as you say, and not, not send it elsewhere? Well, it is, it is something we're working on. I wish the progress was faster than it is, quite frankly, because you're right, we have been talking about it for a number of years. And, and uh, you know, in my district, there's, um, you know, some excellent potato growers and uh, everything from the seed potatoes to the you know, the potatoes that you'd grow and sell, you know, in the grocery store. Um, you'd love to have the whole process uh, all the way to the potato chips, the French fries and everything. And, and there is some of that. Uh, but if you think about all the different things that we grow in Michigan, uh, there's so much opportunity, untapped opportunity that hopefully we'll continue to make progress on. 
As we sit down today, the temperature is taking a, a dive this afternoon, but, but a final note in our last minute about um, outdoor rec uh, tourism uh, aspects. That's also one of your committee assignments. Um, a better season, we assume then, or, or a good one for uh, the ski resorts and so forth for the outdoor sports, although it has been cold. How has the season been, been and continues to shape uh, you up? You know, I'm excited because in my district, snowmobiling is very popular and, and to have snow on the ground and and uh, this kind of a temperature, that, that's a big positive for northern Michigan. Uh, one of the things I'm working on highlighting in this next term is just the magnificent trails that we have in Michigan, whether it's summertime or wintertime. Uh, so much opportunity for families to have recreational opportunities through our Michigan trails. And, and that's something we're going to be working on doing more promoting for uh, in the year ahead. All of that then and the work, obviously, as you said, focused on uh, the budget as we await that proposal coming from the governor. Thanks for uh, the look, kind of summing up where we have been and, and where that work is going to be coming up in the new year. Always good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be with you. We've been uh, speaking with uh, State Senator John Molinar, Republican from Midland, serving in the 36th District. A reminder, too, that our program can be seen again uh, tonight at 2 a.m. here on CMU Public Television and will soon be posted to our website at WCMU.org. You can click on uh, the TV tab and then also to local productions to find our link to a Capitol Report. Thanks to Chris Ogazali and all of our crew here in-house. I'm David Nicholas. Thanks again uh, for your time. We hope you'll join us next week. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues.